welcome to the second uh, webinar in a series of webinars hosted here by the Center for Translational Data Science at the University of Chicago. This series is introducing members of the research community to ways that they can use data commons technology to advance data-driven scientific discovery. The first webinar that we had was an overview of our software as a whole. You can find that past webinar and slides and other information about our software at gen3.org. My name is Alex Van Tol. I'll be moderating today's webinar and Q&A session, and I'm a software engineer here working on the Gen3 software. Today's topic is authentication, authorization, and data access in the Gen3 Data Commons open source software. The webinar will be presented by one of the software engineers here at the center, Rudy Richter. Uh, please note that all webinar participants are going to be muted by default. However, throughout Rudy's presentation, if you do have any questions, please click the Q&A button inside of Zoom and submit your question via text, and we'll have a section after the presentation where we address uh, any other questions that came in through that, that Q&A section. If you do experience any technical difficulties, let us know in the chat. So there should be a separate button for chat. So if you're experiencing any issues, let us know there. The chat is moderated by a project manager here at the center. Fuge Panday. One final note, bear in mind that the webinar today will be recorded. And with that, I will hand things over to Rudy. Great, thank you, Alex. Um, I'm, going ahead, I'm going ahead and uh, sharing my screen through the Zoom here. So in today's webinar, we're going to talk about authentication, authorization, and data access in the Gen3 services. So just for a bit of context and overview from the previous webinar, I'm going to use this quote as um, a brief summary for what a data commons actually does. So data commons co-locate data, storage, and computing infrastructure with commonly used software services, tools, and apps for analyzing and sharing data to create a resource for the research community. So in this webinar, we're going to focus on this aspect of sharing data. So to accomplish that, there's a few things that we need to be able to do. Firstly, we want to authorize users for access to controlled data sets, for example. We want to make the data files available for download. And we want to allow other platforms, uh, including web applications or analytics platforms, to access data in the Gen3 services on behalf of these users. So just for the agenda for um, this webinar, so how we're going to uh, explain the flow for data access. So first, we're going to talk about authentication and authorization. Firstly, what are these terms, uh, as they're sometimes referred to authn and authb? We're going to look at the Gen3 implementation, which we've called Fence, and how Fence interoperates uh, both with the rest of the Gen3 stack and also with outside, uh, with other services and other platforms. Um, and then after that, so we'll look at data access, the fundamental problems for data access in a commons, and the Gen3 implementation, which we call IndexD, and how IndexD works within the rest of the Gen3 stack. Okay, so we'll get started with Fence. So Fence is the Gen3 authentication and authorization service. Uh, let's break down these terms a little bit first. So authentication is who you are, basically. This is um, a unique user. So say if you log into some web page with a username and a password, that identifies you as the user. Uh, we know who you are. The other half of this is authorization. This is what you can do. So for example, if you can access some protected data sets, that is what authorization means, that you're allowed to do um, specific things as, the, as yourself. OK, so we're going to go ahead and walk through a typical flow for a user in a Gen3 Commons and how Fence works in this situation. So let's say we've got a user that goes to the Gen3 portal, and they're going to try to log in. So the first step is that they're going to go to the Fence login. This is going to be uh, what you see. Um, so we're going to go and say log in with Google, and this is at this step logging in with uh, whatever identity provider that Fence has been configured with. So it could be Google in this example, um, or it could be something like NIH iTrust. So um, this is probably a familiar screen to you. So in this case, say you log in with either um, either of these identity providers, and then at that point, 
Fence knows who you are after you've logged in. We know that this user is this person. Um, and so Fence gets back the response and the user is logged in. At this stage, then the user wants to be able to go and do something with some Gen3 service, maybe download some data, run some queries, something like that. And so what's necessary at this stage is there's a bit of magic behind, this, uh, behind the scenes that allows the user to do certain operations. Um, and the way that this is implemented in Fence is through JWTs, which stands for JSON Web Token. So uh, on the right here is an example of the contents of a JWT. So these are tokens that after a user logs in, Fence issues this token to that user that now when, this, uh, when the user comes to a service with this token, we know who they are. Um, they're cryptographically signed by Fence. So it's guaranteed that a user with such a token uh, has been logged in through Fence. And any service across our stack or even externally can inspect these tokens, do this verification, and also look into the contents of the token. And as we can see in this example, there is a bit of user information which uh, can be used for authorization. So the token might contain a bit of information about whether the user is an administrator or not, or perhaps what projects they have access to and what privileges they have in those projects. And there are a pretty wide variety of open source libraries for working with these JWTs. Um, it is an established uh, standard across the web. You can go to the website jwt.io to see a pretty comprehensive list of all the libraries that you could work with. Um, so we use, just for example, um, a couple of these libraries that we're, that we're using in our stack. Uh, Python JOSE and PyJWT for creating and validating these tokens. So that's what allows this half of the flow. Once a user is logged in and Fence has come back to them with this token, now the, the token is stored in that user's browser. And at that point, they're free to access our services through the data portal. And our services will know that they're who they say they are, they're authenticated, and they're allowed to do the operations they're trying to do. Okay, so next let's get into um, interoperability with Fence. So how Fence interfaces with other services, and this is through the protocol OAuth2 and on top of OAuth2, OpenID Connect. So we'll explain these protocols first. So what is OAuth2? OAuth2 is um, a commonly used protocol uh, in web applications which allows an application to access something on another server on behalf of a user. So you've probably seen something like this, say this example with Google, where you have an application that wants to maybe just know who you are on Google or maybe you know, access Google Drive, something like that. So that's OS2. Um, Google is going to go through the flow with this application and then allow them access to something given your consent. Uh, and then on the right here, we have an example of what this would look like the same idea in a Gen3 data commons. If an external application wants to access data on your behalf, um, you'd get this little consent screen that will prompt you to give them access to data on behalf of you. Um, so we're going to go through this flow, the OAuth2 flow, uh, in a little bit of technical detail. So this is the what is happening sort of behind the scenes when a client goes through this flow with Sense. So to start off, this client, which could be um, an external web application that wants to access some data or just some user information. So to start off, the client sends an initial auth request to Fence. Um, at that point, Fence is going to authenticate the user, like we saw through whatever identity provider is configured. And once the user authenticates, then it's going to prompt the user to give this access to the client. After the access is consented to by the user, Fence gets back to the client with a secret code. The client with a secret code can go to Fence and retrieve a set of tokens, which are used for authentication for the user and authorization for um, whatever access that the user has allowed to the client. So there's three tokens that are returned. There's the ID token, the access token, and the refresh token. 
Um, the access and refresh tokens are specified in OAuth 2, and OpenID Connect is what specifies this ID token. So the ID token is meant for the user. Um, all of these tokens look like these JWTs that we just touched on earlier. Um, so the ID token, when it's given to the user, the client can know that this user went through this flow with fence, they're authenticated, they are who they say they are. So the ID token is usable for authentication. And the access and refresh tokens, which are all similar tokens, um, those are used by the client in order to go to, say, um, go back to fence and retrieve something on behalf of the user. So basically, this access token lets the client act as the user. Um, for a few examples of OAuth or OIDC clients in practice, uh, we have a couple of examples you could check out on our GitHub. There's um, a service that we use for handling authentication in workspaces where, so this, this workspace token service retrieves uh, access tokens to um, operate as the user, and this is used in our data portal. Uh, and you can also check out dcf.gen3.org, which has more details about data commons framework and an example of OAuth clients and how OAuth clients work with data access through um, DCO. For actually creating an OAuth client, uh, so there's a couple examples here for packages for Python that you could use to actually build an OAuth client. Um, we use this package called OAuthLib, um, and requests OAuthLib is also a pop popularly used package. Um, so now we're going to do just a quick demo as to what this actually looks like in um, using a data commons. So if we go to, um, say, the kids first portal, we're going to use this as an example. So if we go to the profile page here, this has a setting here for connect to Gen 3. And what this, uh, what this is going to do is, this is going to go through the, um, a quick OAuth flow which links our account on Kids First to our account in Gen 3 in the Fence instance. So if we hit connect here, then what's going to happen is it takes us to the IDP. Um, so at that point, it's gone through I trust probably. Um, we're going to give this a second to load. And now it's connected. So at this point, Kids First would be able to access uh, whatever data sets were granted access to in Gen 3. And so that's a quick example for the OAuth flow in practice. So now we're going to take a look at the architecture for this data access in the Gen 3 services. So as we've just been talking about, so a user which is operating through some client application, which is you know maybe an application like Kids First or any other web application which wants to do some analytics with our data, anything like that. So the user goes through this identity provider flow through Fence, where now the user is logged in and we've determined what access that they have. After this, we want to actually be able to serve data. Now that we know who the user is, we can return some data to the client on behalf of the user so they can actually work with this data. And so this half of the flow depends on index D, which is the next thing we're going to talk about. So index D is the Gen3 data indexing service. And to break this down just a little bit, indexing, what we, what we mean by indexing is to locate data with easily used identifiers. So this is kind of a fundamental problem in working with a data commons. We have some data files in storage, which can potentially be very large. And we want to be able to abstract this so that the user is not really concerned with the specific files themselves. The user doesn't have to manipulate the files or be concerned with the implementation for their storage. So we want to have really some more abstract identifier that lets us work with these files more easily. And so this is what index D does. Given some identifier for the file, which could be uh, just a hash of the file, like an MD5 sum, 
or a data GUID, which we'll get into more detail shortly, or a human readable alias that you've defined. Using any of these, IndexD is able to retrieve the record for that data file. And in this record, IndexD has stored the locations where the data file actually lives. So IndexD is providing one level of abstraction over the actual storage locations so that we can work with just these higher level identifiers and not really be concerned with the specific storage implementation. So revisiting this flow that we just brought up, this is the second half of the data access flow where once we have authenticated this user, uh, now we want to return some data for them and this is where IndexD comes in. So at this point, um, a client can make a request to Fence to access some data and Fence is going to use IndexD to actually look up the data and retrieve it from storage. So for example, if we're using say S3 on AWS, then the client makes a request to Fence. Fence looks up the storage URL using IndexD and it's going to be able to generate a pre-signed URL that then the client can either use that URL for download and we'll get into uh, one more um, feature about IndexD, which is uh, distributed resolution. So we've brought up this sort of basic case for IndexD where we have some identifier for our data file, whether that be a GUID or a hash or an alias for this file. And we can give this to IndexD and it's able to retrieve the file. So in a more elaborate case, NXD also supports indexing files over an entire network of other resolvers. So in this case, these other resolvers could be other instances of IndexD, or it could be even a completely different API, um, some other set of software that NXD has been designed to inter interoperate with. So given some uh, data GUID, where the data GUID has some identifier, contained within it for identifying the next resolver, NXD is able to pass this along to the next resolver, which actually knows the location of the file in storage. Okay. So we, here we have just a quick example. So we're going to visit uh, this site, datagoods.org, which explains a bit more about the concept of data GUIDs. So we're going to take this uh, data GUID here and actually see where the, we can go and see the indexd record and where the file is stored. So here is um, datagoids.org. There's a bit about um, more details about datagoids. Um, fundamentally, a datagoid is just an identifier for your data where, so it has this prefix, like we mentioned, where that points out the specific resolver that knows where that data lives so that we can retrieve uh, a record for a data file across an entire network of resolvers like IndexD. So if we paste in our GUID here and hit resolve, this is going to give us the record. So here we have just an example of the actual records that are stored in IndexD. So it has some information about the file. Here's the checksum. For example, we could also use this checksum in IndexD to locate this file and just a bit more information about the data file. And here we have the URL that this, uh, that this data file is actually stored at. So here we have these two different URLs that we could potentially use to download this data file. And this is how Fence is actually going to return a URL to us if we want to grant access to a data file. It's going to grab this record, it's going to get the URL from here, and then use that to generate, for example, a pre-signed URL which will give a client or a user access to this file. Okay, so just to, just to recap, um, so this is the overall architecture for data access within Gen 3 and also with interfacing with external applications. So we've gone through the login flow where a user has um, received a token or the client has received a set of tokens on behalf of the user that now we know who the user is and what data sets they're authorized to access. And at that point, 
the client application going through Fence, which goes through IndexD, is able to retrieve data files from storage and either use those files directly and run some analysis or return them to the user or anything else that you might want to do. So that's the presentation. Um, if you want to learn some more about our software, you can visit uh, github.com slash ucfetus, which has uh, the code for Fence and IndexD as well as many of our other services. You can visit gen3.org for more information about our technology. Um, there's a Gen3 community channel on uh, Slack, so feel free to ask us for an invite to that. Um, if you have specific support questions, we have the support email, DCF support at datacommons.io. And you can also visit ctds.uchicago.edu for more information about the organization. And just for a few examples of data commons that are using uh, the Gen3 software. Um, so we showed the example of Kids First and how we might grant data access to these other applications. Um, these are all some examples that are using our software in one way or, or another. Um, and finally, so for the next webinar, we'll be talking about data modeling uses, using the services affectionately known as Sheepdog and Peregrine. And that will be on May 9th. So be sure to tune in for that one. And with that, I'm going to turn things back over to Alex for any questions. Great. Thank you very much, Rudy. Uh, so at this point, we're going to start addressing the questions that you guys have submitted to the Q&A section so far. If you haven't yet, please submit any questions that you have by clicking on that Q&A button in Zoom. And joining us for the Q&A session is the lead architect for Gen 3, Phyllis Tang. Welcome. Uh, so the first question reads, if I'm a user, how do I find data in Gen 3 that is related to my research that I have access to? Do you want to take this one? Sure. Um, so um, the part that we talk about today is uh, focused on data access. And before they do that part, they need to figure out what data they want to have access. And that's a separate feature in the Gen 3 data comments. So in Gen 3 data comments, we have data exploration um, web pages or uh, SDK and API um, for you to figure out what kind of data you want to have access to. And, and then uh, that part is integrated um, with the data access part. So um, when you use the Gen 3 data comments, you um, use the data exploration part to figure out the data and then that cause data access to actually finally find the data location for you to put uh, either in your analytic environment or somewhere else that's outside of the Gen3 data comments. Great. Uh, so we've got another question here. Does the distributed GUID system support caches like DNS, for example? Um, so right now, our actual implementation does not cache the uh, lookup um, like based on um, like what, what people look up before. Um, but we do uh, store um, the like the prefix is used as a hint to um, to instruct the distributed lookup like where that is the this um, the ID started with this prefix look like so it it has a heuristic algorithm to find uh, like uh, to start like start from the most likely place to look up for the record. Next question is, how do I become a client to send to get access to users' data? Rudy, do you want to take this one? Yeah, sure. Um, so we touched on this just a little bit in the presentation as to how you might go about implementing a client. Um, on the, uh, the dcf.org site, we have more details about um, actually if you want to get a client set up to uh, interoperate with DCF, then what steps you need to go through in order to accomplish that. And you can always contact our support email as well for more questions about that process. Um, Alex, do you have any more details on that? I think that pretty much covers it. Yeah, and I, I, I want to just briefly mention that, like generally when you use Google, you have an automated way for register a client as a user. Um, but um, 
for most of com our comments, the uh, governance structure um, prevent us from doing that. Like we have to only allow people creating new ONDC client if you meet uh, some security compliance. Right. Okay, the next question is, how can we become contributors to Gen3 on GitHub, specifically the manifest repo? Um, uh, that's a great question. Uh, I'm not sure, uh, but I will say that, uh, so our software is open source and we are more than welcome uh, to welcome pull requests to uh, the software. And then if you're really interested in it, I would definitely suggest getting on our uh, Gen3 community Slack channel so that we can kind of coordinate um, with you as to what you're working on. And we can maybe provide some pointers to the code of where you might want to be actually looking to, to make the change. Um, but I'm, I'm unsure about the manifest repo part, so I don't know. Yeah, okay. and so like before you make a pull request, you're welcome to create an issue to discuss about what kind of features you want to support and the proposal that you have. And you, you can either submit GitHub issue or you can use our forum or you can use support email or Slack. And one more comment on that. If you go to gen3.org, gen3.org has some details about the technical aspects of the Gen3 stack, including the architecture and um, what standards we use for actually implementing anything if you're interested in that. Right, and then we have some like development uh, guideline or conventions um, that will be helpful if you want to contribute code right. for us to review. Awesome. Uh, the next question reads, if I'm building a data commons, why would I use Sense instead of other auth services like Keycloak or Auth0? So, um, so they, um, so Keycloak and Auth0 are other options for authentication and authorization, and um, that they're not really like equivalent to Fence because like we provide auto data access. And um, so it's kind of a superset of the features um, compared to Keycloak and Auth0, which is more targeted for just the office. And it's a general, there are general purposes um, software. And so for Fence, we, um, the service we, de uh, we design um, just the it's driven by the like use cases for scientific uh, community and the data commons ecosystem. So we put a lot of effort and prioritize um, how to make it easily integrate you know, interoperable with other um, data or analytic platforms within the data commons ecosystem. And um, so. Um, also, we um, participate actively in GA4GH, so we are one of the, the implementer and we also drive the stack of GA4GH to um, make the ecosystem easily interoperable. Um, so using, using GA3 Fence and Index C, um, it helps you to uh, work with other platforms um, in, uh, that, that may be set up by other people. Um, so that it, it provides you easy interoperability and it's also uh, more tailored to support scientific compute use cases. Great, and that actually segues into the next question perfectly. Uh, this, so the next question is, how do we manage different levels of access? Uh, for example, individuals having access to some studies but not other studies. Um, so as Phyllis was saying, Fence supports um, two different kind of methods for syncing the authorization information. So it could be an external source so if you're familiar with dbGaP, um, a lot of our commons use dbGaP for authorization. So a researcher has to have uh, permission to a given program or project through dbGaP. And we actually send support syncing from dbGaP out of the box. Um, so we can determine, uh, make authorization decisions based off of the, the whitelist that dbGaP um, publishes. If it's not uh, a, a system that needs to use information from dbGaP, then we support a generic uh, file that we can sync from where you would identify which uh, projects a user has access to. I don't know if either of you want to expand on that. Um, I guess we will talk about it later. Like uh, one of the items in our road, roadmap is uh, we will also support um, more non-technical uh, administrative users to use um, a user interface to manage users easily. Okay, uh, the next question reads, does, uh, will a client app use the Sense API or does it use OAuth? Um, so this is kind of a, a 
a little bit of a nuanced question. So the OAuth is a, is a specification that we adhere to with our Fence API. So you would actually be hitting the Fence API, but the endpoints that you're hitting are well-defined and conformant to the OAuth spec. Uh, so hopefully that answers that. Right, and I want to... <laughs> Go ahead. <laughs> so um, because we are here to the spec, so you can expect to use a standard libraries, standard OAuth or IDP libraries in the language that you use. And you should not uh, expect to write um, custom codes just, just to work with them. Right. So that's exactly what I was going to say. <laughs> uh, next question. Are there plans for supporting single sign-on across multiple sites using a single instance of that? Um, so we have plans to essentially like, provide central expense service for some of the use cases. Um, so it is more of a like, security and governance question instead of a technical question about uh, where um, is the system boundaries and who is responsible for what. And also, um, like the single sign-on user experience um, is um, like just focused on like whether a user can feel like they're just logging in once, which can be solved with a single fence or not. And there are also other aspects of like a central fence system, uh, which is more for like a service use case. Like if you're, you're, you're a compute platform, you some platform probably prefer to talk to one endpoint and two. So that will be a, like a slightly different thing. So basically this question is kind of complicated to answer, um, but um, we have planned to support some of the use cases about this, but maybe not all. Okay, great. Uh, so another question. If we want to build a data commons using Gen 3, what is the best way to proceed? Is there a specific person I should contact? Um, so I guess that is a good question. Does DCF support email is best or getting a hold of someone Standing up a data comment. Yeah. Using Gen 3 or just using Gen 3. Using Gen 3. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. So you can contact the support or you can join the Gen 3 community. And um, so we have um, Docker Compose playground that you can get a taste of Gen 3. Um, but the actual production system that's secure and robust. Uh, we have a fairly sophisticated automation frameworks to uh, do continuous deployment and all the logging, monitoring, and all that. So um, that is also open source. Uh, we, we will provide support for you to uh, bootstrap it and maintain it, but um, it will need you, uh, like, if you want to do that, you will need to also like, be pretty DevOps savvy. Right, and if you go to um, the gen3.org website, it has a lot of the information that Phil has just talked about, about like if you want to just test things out, uh, like rolling the entirety of our microservices uh, in Gen3, then there's that Docker Compose, and there's some documentation on gen3.org on how you would actually um, get that set up. Right, and, and just, just to be clear that the Docker Compose is just a playground. It doesn't, it's not a full featured data comment because we don't, Imagine you want to use that for fully featured data comments. Great. Okay, the next question is Would this authentication system interoperate with something like Sage's Synapse, Synapse platform? Um, so, is it more for uh, which part? Like logging from Sage? Uh, like using Sage as an identity provider or allowing Sage to reference data in our platform? Like, I want to understand like which which part are you trying to ask about integration <laughs> yeah it, there's no other info uh, but if it is using it as an identity provider then we we do support if there's use cases um, beyond Google or NIH I trust okay. or other identity providers that people want to use um, we've set up the software in such a way that it's fairly simple to add new identity providers um, and then it would just be a configuration change uh, when you're deploying to determine which one you'd like to use so if it's just as an identity provider, um, that can be done somewhat simply. But if it's something else, then ask another question and we'll get to it. <laughs> uh, okay, 
So the next question reads, do you support OAuth 2 implicit grant if we have a single page application? Yep, we support implicit plan and we have an uh, example JavaScript, JavaScript, app, uh, JavaScript app that you can uh, see how it works with that implicit flow. Great. Uh, the next question is, can you revoke an OAuth token? Um, token revocation. So that is that's part of the Fence API. For the complete uh, the complete set of anything that you might want to do concerning revoking tokens or anything like that. Um, so the OAuth 2 specification is published online as um, as an RFC. So if you um, if you go to that, you can see more details about the API for um, for example, revoking tokens, and that's also included in the API documentation on Fence, on our GitHub. Great. Uh, next question reads, can I update the metadata of the, an object, uh, I'm assuming an index D, and if so, are there specific fields we can update? Also, can we switch the data GUID to a different file? Uh, so I'll answer part of that and then throw it to somebody else. Um, so if the file itself is changing, then we, you would get a new data GUID. So the, the idea is that the data GUID um, will always point to the same file so that we can have reproducibility in research so that you can cite this GUID and it will always be pointing to a given file. So if the file itself changes, you'll get a different GUID. So you can't switch that. Um, mm -hmm. Is there anything else? Um, yeah. Right. So that's like the one of the core... Um, promise we uh, we have when we design index D because it's the the use case we want to solve is for reproducible scientific compute. Uh, we do provide uh, like semantical like a versioning system on top of that where you can like create like a ID for like that conceptual data object, uh, and then you can use that as a base identifier that links all your actual data GUIs uh, that actually have changing data content. And in terms of the metadata, um, so we have the differentiation between like file medical metadata and just file metadata. So file metadata means like file size, checksum, that kind of thing. And of course, we don't allow changing file size and checksum because that means your content is changed. Uh, we, we do allow you to update like the uh, data location, so you can like add a new location to a data GUI. Say we add a new um, location in a new Google bucket, and you can update that in our URL. And there are other like lightweighted file metadata that you can change in NextD. Um, but as I mentioned, uh, this part is not for data exploration, um, so we don't put any biomedical metadata in NextD. Uh, that's uh, that's separate Gen3 services to man maintain like clinical data and file specimen metadata uh, that's outside of uh, data access part. Great. Uh, the next question is, can I use index D with an authorization token generated by Keycloak? No. <laughs> um, because uh, it's, um, so, so the keys uh, that different auth server issue have like an issuer and uh, our security policy only uh, whitelist the issuer that, that's hosted by us. Uh, and also um, it's, it's the token that we generate tells our microservice what data sets these, the user that hosts the token should have access to. And we need to uh, what, like trust the issuer so that we trust the information in the token. Great. Uh, next question, does index D allow you to identify pre-existing data GUIs associated with data if you have a hash for the data, like a reverse lookup? Um, so I think the question is, can you search by hash? And the answer is yes, you can. Um, so the GUID is one way of searching index D, but you can also query based on the hash or you can identify it um, if you uh, create the record and give it an alias, which is just some human readable uh, string, then you can also use that to, to search index D uh, to get the record. 
uh, and this is a follow-up to the Sage Synapse thing. So yes, uh, the question was allowing Sage to access and analyze data from the commons. Got it. Um, so, um, so that's an interesting use case, and um, so um, we will need to work with Sage for them to add support on their end. Um, we work, we already work with a um, couple platforms on different projects for them to add integration uh, with Gen3 Data Commons. And um, so if, if we heard use cases like this and we have needs from researchers, we will be happy to collaborate with Sage to um, help them to integrate with Gen3 Data Commons. Right. Yeah, and then they, uh, the follow-up is more generally uh, can you use another platform to analyze or access data from the commons through an auth flow that feels seamless to the end user? Um, and so, so part of this could be achieved through kind of the client flow that we showed. So we do have clients that are accessing data on behalf of a user. You would just have to become a client to the Fence instance where in the, in the data commons where the data that you're interested in is, is located. Right, and as I say, uh, each data commons has its own governance structure, so it, uh, it will be a per data commons decision to decide whether it trusts a platform so it allows the data to flow to there. Right. The next question is, if I'm already a researcher using a Gen3 commons, how do I add new data to index C and provide access to it? Wanna take that one? Yeah, sure. Um, so part of, sorry, could you go over the question uh, again? Yeah, if I'm already a researcher mm -hmm. using a Gen3 Commons, how do I add new data to index C and provide okay. access? Okay, so if you're using a Gen3 Commons to upload your data, then the data indexing is going to happen pretty much automatically. So if you're using the data portal, for example, to submit your data, or if you're using um, one of the tools that we've published, the Gen3 client for data upload or the Python SDK, all of those, if you use that to upload your data, it's going to be indexed within our system automatically. So after the upload goes through, um, in all of those cases, you're probably going to see returned to you a UUID or a GUID, and that's the, that's the GUID that comes from index e. So if you look at the response from whatever method you used for your data upload, um, you could take that that GUID and go to the the index D instance for where uh, wherever you uploaded the data to and see the index D record. Great. Uh, another question. Uh, I've seen some recent work with Arborist and Pigeon. Can you speak to the future development of these technologies? Uh, so generally, and then I'll let other people expand. Arborist um, is something that is on the horizon for us. So this is a role-based access control system that would be integrated into um, Gen3 as a whole so that our services can, can more easily figure out what a user has permission to do within the system. Um, and then I'll throw it to you guys to expand and talk about Pigeon maybe. Um, so I, I will briefly talk about what kind of roles a user has on what project. Um, but Arborist add a more generified um, language for like for the policy engine to specify all kinds of scenarios of fine grain like fine grain access uh, for all kinds of resources we provide within a data commons. Um, so it's like a more sophisticated model for um, and a more powerful engine. So um, pitching is a lightweighted um, uh, core mandata service that we provided to add um, some of the, um, uh, so it, it's kind of not, like, so, so it kind of um, adds some information from our metadata service about uh, what this data is, like what's the data format and all that, and also like the file size and all that information to provide a, a easier view for people given a data grid. And then in our data portal, we have a page uh, given a data grid where you can see all these kind of information. So, so then, if you reference a data grid in your paper, you can easily reference that page that gives you high-level high information about these data objects. So with that, uh, it looks like the final question that we have for today is, 
what new features can we expect from Gen 3 in the future? Um, and I'll touch on that and then throw it over to Rudy to expand on it. But so Arborist is one of the things that we're currently working on um, as far as uh, expanding our RBAC goes. And then uh, another thing that we're working on is what we're calling an admin portal. So it's a, a way for someone who's maybe not so technical to go in to uh, a more user-friendly experience and manage user access. Um, so this is going to be some sort of UI that someone can log into and then give access to users or maybe put users inside of groups and assign access to groups for specific data access um, in, a, in a more easy way. Uh, and then do you want to expand on the RBAC? Yeah, sure. A bit? So kind of to, to touch on both of the previous two questions, um, the Arborist design is also, uh, so Arborist is, is designed such that it would be capable of interoperating with other systems outside of just our stack. If um, if we have a situation where, um, say, there's a different a different group with their own identity provider that um, we want to control access to shared resources in a well-defined way across our systems, so that would be part of um, what Arborist is designed to support. Um, and yeah, pretty much everything that Alex just said about easier, uh, easier user management, sorry, and um, the interface for users to manage their own groups and so forth. Great. Well, thank you, Rudy and Phyllis. Uh, as a note to all the participants, uh, once the webinar ends, you'll be prompted to complete a feedback survey. And later on, you should get some information that will uh, be a link to a recording of this presentation and also a link to register for our next webinar, which is scheduled for May 9th. And in, that, in the third webinar, we'll cover some more specific technical features of the Gen3 platform uh, in regards to data submission and data querying. If you do have any remaining questions that didn't get answered today um, about anything we mentioned in the webinar, Gen3 software as a whole, or the Center for Translational Data Science, um, please feel free to contact us via gen3.org or you can visit ctdf.uchicago.edu. And with that, the, this concludes today's webinar. Thank you again for participating, and we'll see you next time.